Blog Talk Radio. Well, here we go, guys. It's that True North podcast hosted by a brother, a mentor, and a friend, Billy North, up there in Seattle, Washington. Yours truly, Mark Mancini, coming down to five in Los Angeles, 347-205-9631. 30 minutes goes by quick. If you happen to miss it, catch the archive, blogtalkradio.com forward slash Mancini sports podcast platforms, wherever you subscribe to the podcast, Power now by Mancini Media. So without further ado, so I lay the red carpet down to put the podium in place, hand off the mic. Billy, how are you, brother? I know Dusty came up a little short, but taking those Astros to the playoffs again had to be something. How can people get a hold of you? And now you're bringing Shooty Babbitt in here, Oakland A's uh, broadcaster, player. Man, this is going to be fun tonight, my friend. Uh, this has uh, at least two episodes oh yeah minimum <laughs> yeah this guy has been around the game for what 30 years almost uh as a, as a scout and a broadcaster but i'm doing fine mark uh you can reach me at bill norte b-i-l-l-n-o-r-t-e one five at gmail.com I got a guy sitting here over there that we go back a long ways. This is one of the best people that you'll ever meet in your life. Uh, uh, we have a, a good friend in, com- in common named Dusty Baker. And the one thing I talked to Dusty earlier today, and I talked to him about the trip, Shooty, that you, right. you guys went on with your your father's. Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. How are you? Uh first of all, I just want to um thank um you and Mark for considering me worthy enough to be on the airways with you guys today. Uh I am not worthy of complaining about anything. Uh, my life is great. I'm healthy. Uh today I was able to do everything that I intended on doing and I think whenever you can maximize a day, you have to consider that you know, to be a success because we just don't know how quickly things can change these days. So I'm one that just thrive on the things that are positive that are happening. And, man, it's good to be with you guys. This is amazing, um, Billy, being with you going full circle, man, as a kid, um, you being a part of, you know, my brotherhood now. You you invite of, you know, my brother, rest his soul, who I call my big brother, when you and Claudel, who I was raised by in the neighborhood of Berkeley, Mm-hmm. Um, and to see him in the big leagues and seeing what you guys are doing in 71, that's when my eyes got opened up to what a major league baseball player looked like at 12 years old and to be considered a friend and uh, everything else, a fraternal brother that we have to bond and we've been through in the good times, man, is just truly an honor, man. So I just want to thank you for that. I know that's more than you probably asked for today. No, that's fine. Um, I'll tell you this, though, Shooty, it's been a blur. Man, you talk about time fly. Oh my God! <laughs> well, let's talk about uh, let's talk about Dusty and Vida. You know, those guys there. You have the same. I have the same feelings about both of them as you do, and and just glad to have met two individuals like that in my life, and and Vida has passed away, broke my heart, but he had a good run. And I got the opportunity to kind of be with him through uh, the last six, seven months of of that problem that he had. And, and he showed so much courage that it was inspirational. And what do you think about those two? Well, you know, I don't even know if courage speaks enough of how we handled it because a lot of times if we can't see the light at the end of the tunnel, we don't believe there's no light to be seen. And when you were going in the direction that he was and when you'd see him, besides my dad, Biden was the strongest man I'd ever been around in my life. Uh, my dad was from Natchitoches, Louisiana, um, mm-hmm. a 
small town outside of Camp, or well, Campy, Louisiana, outside of a town called Natchitoches. And once I got an opportunity to be around Vita at a function um, years ago, my mom passed away 20 years ago, but she was having a 50th birthday party, and I was talking, I was going to tell Vita I was going to my mom's birthday party, and she was from Shreveport, and all of them was country folks that migrated from Louisiana. My to people Louisiana. are from Shreveport. Come on, man. So <laughs> everybody's up here, and the only thing they ever knew about Vida Blue is what they heard because they barely had a TV, and they knew it was a good boy, boy that made it good. And Vida volunteered to come by that party. And, man, let me tell That's you. That's him. That's him. It was like, are you kidding me, Vida Blue, at our party here with us old country bunking? <laughs> And so I showed Vida I had this collage in my bedroom uh, when I was a 12-year-old, and I had all these pictures, all these great players on these small pictures and stuff. But I had one big picture to the side, and I had it wrote in crayon, written in crayon, Vida Blue on the bottom with a big picture of him. And, man, when I showed that to him, I had my little league uniform on, I had my high stirrups on, I had my high top converse on. I was clean, man. You know, I was, I was like a fighter. You know what I mean? So, and then go and look, look, and you know the relationship we had. We all had together. We love. We all brothers, man. And it's just, I sometimes, you know, you look at my baseball card and you would say, it's still, you know, I kind of be quiet when I could some of the gatherings because I feel like I'm among the elite and the best and I, I, I get invited and I don't want to mess that up. So to be in the company and to be spoke of by people like yourself, and, and and when you talk about Dusty, I mean, God, God, you know, Dusty's a godfather, um, and I don't think that anything else needs to be said. But the godfather, about that. I know that's right. So, <laughs> he, he Dusty took his dad and my dad to uh, Notre Dame, and my dad now barely finished high school and came here to California and uh, became his own man. Worked at General Motors, ended up opening his own business, had a tune-up and brake service and a paint and body business. And, man, my dad just did great for He's a real man. I just wish I was half the man that my dad was, man. He was a bad dude, man. And and uh, Mr. Baker, oh, Dusty told me they was, they was in the back seat telling stories, and you guys was just listening to him. Listening to him, man. And, just, and the great part about it, Billy, is that, I used to think I was crazy because I find myself all the time since my dad been gone about eight years. You know, I'm always someone. When my dad used to, when my dad would say, or you know, my dad would tell you, "Man, look at here." But I said, "Man, thank God for that." You know what I mean? Because I got something to lean on for the rest of my life. His spirit, and he was my best man in my wedding and everything. And that's wow. me and Mr. Quinn are the closest things to my dad that I can have on this planet because I know if I talk to Dusty. He's going to give it to me real. He's not going to tell me what I want to hear because um, I'll tell him, man, I'm being politically correct with me, brother. You know what I mean? To tell me the truth, which he always does, man. And he, he's always there for anybody. Everybody knows that, man. So he's just a special person, man. He's just he's my big brother. I don't know why he, he, he loved me the way he do, man, but I swear I guess everybody who talk about him say the same thing. So, yeah. You know, I feel fortunate to be in that circle for sure. Yeah, it, uh, just it's just a wonderful experience, Mark. Well, um, the, the the thing that I want to talk about, Shooty, is the nickname. Who gave you that? And boy, that that must have been nice uh, having that little nickname to run with. Very unique. You know, Mark, it's gone in so many different directions, but <laughs> it has been. Uh, and most people that want to know how I got the nickname, that they, they never would have thought about or would never know how I got it because it's, you know, as you were, you shout out, I mean, are you, you know, it has something to do with being fast because I played sports and I was fast, you know. Um, but Don Barksdale used to be, it was one of the first uh, black in yeah. the area. And when I was a kid, you know, my dad would come home and the, all he had was the radio, was putting on the radio or something like, hey, shooty, rooty, tooty. And my dad would say that to me, man, and I would just crack up in the crib and shit before you know, excuse my French, um, he would, uh, I would just crack up and 
lo and, you, lo and behold, I got stuck with Shooty. You know, my real name is Mac. Uh, it was difficult for me to tell people my name was Mac as a young man and a teenager because, you know, I was a, you know, somewhat of a ladies' man. And, you know, I, I you know, approached a young lady. And, he was a Mac. Yeah, yeah, right, Mac Daddy. And I got <laughs> <all hung. laughs> But shooting sports and being, uh, you know, it, it's been great for me. You know, I've um, had people name me pets after me and a couple of kids and stuff, man. So um, it's funny, all my sons, um, even though my oldest boy name is Zachary, all his friends call him Shooty. And, and, and you know, it, and it, 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 it's, it's kind of cool. So, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I got yeah. I was, my nickname <laughs> was Spud. <laughs> <laughs> Say how's old Spud Nut today? And back in those days, wow. Spud Nuts were little donuts. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had that name before I was born. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, guys, uh, Shooty, we, we, we've been talking about. They've been in the news, the Oakland A's. I know you played uh, for them. You, you you've worked for them. You, you were born up there. Um, it, it's kind of sad to see a team being talked about and moving out of town and going to Las Vegas. And we've, we've known this before, you know, Vegas is not going to treat them like Oakland has as, as far as the fact, you know, you, you, you've nurtured them. We've, we've seen the heydays of the seventies. We've seen the Conseco days. I just think, you know, there should have been more to keep this team in Oakland. And now it looks like the hand runs on the wall that they're going to Vegas, but I don't know who's going to watch this team in 115 degree weather in the, middle of summer. <laughs> yeah, you no, know, it's it's unfortunate. I'll just put it like that. Uh it's inevitable. Uh but it's not a hundred percent yet. Because it's right. still a right. That's political. exactly right. Yeah. A lot of political minutia is still going on. And I can only speak for my experience and feel for those who's going to be affected uh, in a more detrimental way than I am. I've, I've been blessed to get drafted from that team when I was 18 years old, mm-hmm. be a part of the organization, yeah. playing the big league. I worked a real job for seven years after, you know, they ran me out and I just had, was bitter. And then I finally got an opportunity back in 94 to get back in the game as a scout with the Braves. Uh, we went to two World Series, 95, 96. Uh, my work gave me an opportunity to go to Diamondbacks for the expansion draft where I helped assemble a team in 98 and 96, and we didn't play until 98, and we won the World Series in 2001. Mm-hmm. Mark came in in 2006 and wanted to go in a different direction, and then I was like part of the change, and I died and went to heaven and got hired by the Mets and worked for 12 years, Uh, went to the World Series, lost. And then after 12 years, it happened again. And I was so frustrated, and I made a phone call, and before I could get it all out of my mouth, Billy Bean welcomed me with open arms. And I'm going to be 65 years old next year, and that organization has allowed me to work until I get ready to retire. Wow. so many people. It's been so good to my family. I've been in this game. This will be my 44th year, 29th as a scout. I mean, how in the world can I fix my mouth to say anything negative about the experience and what's about to happen? But yeah. for the people, the that- younger folks that's getting involved and they're just now getting invested, the people that make a living there, taking tickets and working at that broke down building and this and every and other and helping hold that together. And them 10, 11,000 fans that have been as loyal as anybody could be, keeping those doors open, man. We could sit up there forever, and I could find a whole lot to pout and talk crazy about. But call me and ask me how I felt about it. And it's <laughs> about trying to get it turned around. I got a lot of friends with a lot of money and impact and want to do it. And for some reason, they can't get it done. 
you know, it, it's sad, man. It's sad, bro. But you know what? It's just like me. I moved. I moved up to the white tees. I was playing the blue tees. I was getting the ball pretty good. And I know how <laughs> I'm going to be moving up to the red tees. This guy's will. <laughs> I got to get out the way. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's just well, and it's not. Here, yeah, it, it, and not only that, guys, you know, it's it's the journey. I've been blessed enough to do a podcast for the Pittsburgh Pirates for three years. Oh, and it, I always say, maybe it's going to open up. Maybe I'll get into Pittsburgh as, a, as an analyst or something. Boyhood dream. Uh, but, you know, the one thing that you bring up, and, and Bill brings this up a lot, and, and I always follow this, it's not the goal, it's the journey, but also it's on God's timing. It, it, so many of us always try to, you know, figure we're, we're putting the time in, we're putting the effort, but, you know, good work doesn't go unnoticed. Sometimes it just takes a little longer to hit the destination. Any truth to that? No question, Mark. And, and keep in mind this also. I am more concerned about the fabric of the game and who's going to do the sewing because it's a different demographic. The game is played differently limited or lack of more people have interest in the game. Uh, and where is the game going? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. It's just, you know, it's just, man, it's just, man. Look here, bro. I used to braid my hair, get a little curl, uh, <laughs> roll my <laughs> man, I, I can't get it back. <laughs> Somebody told me if you eat almonds, that's the year if that was tried to eating them like a monkey out there every day. <laughs> I'll tell you this, though, about how I feel about the history of Oakland and baseball. Yes. From the beginning, baseball has treated Oakland like a redheaded stepchild. Oh. And they never, they never really, any of the others never really cultivated uh, uh, any systems or, 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 what do I want to say? I want to say, th- it, Oakland was a city and it's an anomaly. It's a great city, and but baseball never really ever cultivated the relationship with the city and the owners and and the coaches and the players when they got out of that ballpark after a game they all got on 680 and went out there to the the valley and nobody ever made that left turn and went and, and did things in Oakland and I've always had a thing Oakland is a, uh, is a societal anomaly that baseball could have put done a, done uh, uh, a community service by uh, uh, cultivating the the city and and bringing the fruits to the city that they brought to many other cities. And to me, it it was a, a systematic disinclusion. And the thing is, is that but when you spoke before a tr- a t- a shooting, it was about, I'm not sure they're going to move. I've seen, it, I've seen relocations before, but this one has a whole different, it's not going smooth, no. you know. And I think that uh, uh, going to Vegas, you remember that sign in the locker room, the one in every locker room you ever been in said no gambling. <laughs> yeah. And now yeah. baseball is making money off of oh. online gambling and oh. and oh. and betting and, and all that stuff. And I don't like to be in towns that stay up all night because I think I'm missing something. <laughs> yeah, well, not no more. <laughs> He's speaking for the masses. Um, yeah. I'm- where I am, I'm gonna be in the bed where I know what time I get in there. But you know what, though, Bill? I mean, you you, you make you make a great point, you know, on, on a couple of issues, and it's it's just I don't know, man. It's the the players 
never lived there. They rented there. They left. When the season was over, they was gone. Um, ownership in the, in the community, other than the Hawks family, it was a good run there for a little while. But it's always been, you know, I don't know. Man, it's way above my pay grade. We'll just leave it at that. Um, but what you're saying, there, there, there's a wholesale amount of people that feel the same way. So Yeah. We uh, had Andy Doley, John. Oh, and boy. That was a, a – we had him on a couple of times, and it was – he told yeah. us some insights about what what was happening there and that. And, and he was he was very, very emphatic about calling some people out of, uh, in that organization. And, and it's the kind of thing that, uh, like I said, what they bought the team uh, – uh, the Fisher bought the team for what eighty five million or hundred and twelve or something like that. The team is valued at two point two billion now, and he never did anything, never put any money back into it. Oh. And, and but then, you know, I don't want to get you in the no situation. Hey, because, man. And, they know my what I do. They they sit. They give me. 12, 13 teams uh, in the Midwest League and the Texas League, and I go get them and I write reports and put them in the computer and be ready to answer the question when they call me. Other than yeah. that, that's my expertise. Other than I have to leave all that other stuff to, you know, what you can't control, you can't control, bro. You know hey, I mean? Control what you can, but more important than that, control your reaction to what you can't. Yeah, that's a good way of now looking you, at it. Yeah, you you scouted for how long? This will be my 29th year. Uh, uh, three. What weeks. What's changed in the players? Uh, a lot. In the game. A lot. I mean, to me, I just always felt that baseball was um, instinct and skill versus will, and that's what makes it a game um, because everybody's skill set is compiled of the same components but used in different ways. When you start telling people how to go about it and you start changing players and you start dictating what guys do, then you're taking individual individuality take- out of the game. You're taking the talent and the, the innate skill out of it. And Absolutely. You, the players players are more like automatons than than back in the day where there was flair. You know, uh, we got to play the game with uh, uh, wide open, and we forced the game. And and now now it's it's better. Hey man. I'll tell you how many stolen bases I would have had if that oh. base was that was that big. It looks like a pizza box. Oh. <laughs> I'll tell you, man. Oh, unbelievable, man. And the pitcher came to he's got to get you out in three throws over there the first base, and he can't come over there. Come on, man. There used to be a way of scouting that a player's skill set would dictate if he could play a certain position and could you project that skill set playing at the major league level? I have tools, yeah. Absolutely, okay? Not a quantitative, analytic, or projective. Uh, uh, I, all this crap, man, uh about what a guy might do five years from now. You don't know what you're going to do tomorrow. Right. You know, a player is different. If a guy doesn't have instinct, he can't make adjustments on his own. The, 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 the game will be so hard. The better players in sports in general are the ones that can slow the game down. They right. can almost make the game stop when everybody else cannot control their heart rate, their speed, yeah. all of that. You know, the Chris Mullins of the world is going fast but going slower than everybody else. Uh, You can't teach that kind of stuff. So you're going to make little guys that have 
single swings that should be contact type hitters, and you're going to create angle in their path so they can create launch angle. Launch angle. Come on, Lord, man. Have mercy. Just, you're not staying in you're not staying in the hitting zone long enough. How about this one? I'll keep it along. Why not get more capable Hall of Famers or guys who've had great careers in certain areas and allow them to talk or teach a little bit? Okay. Okay. Opposed to somebody It's being else. run by it's being run by a bunch of people that never played the game. I'm not gonna tell the pilot how to fly Delta Airlines. <laughs> okay, I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna say I can teach. You. I'm just saying I want somebody telling me how to fly a plane at them flew one, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and the bad part about it that is uh, the narrative that you hear from all players that from back in the day is that they don't even watch it anymore because it was so boring. Yeah. You know? It's, it's, it's crazy. It's, it's hard to it's hard to legislate. I maintain one of the things that I got so frustrated with was the fact they put six guys on one side of the field and you keep hitting the ball over there. Man, don't tell me about no frustrated B. Frustrated, frustrated is playing for a crazy man like Billy Martin who's telling me where to play, where to move me. <laughs> I got Don Baylor. I got Hal McCray. I got Dave Winfield, who I got. That's one of my most famous pitchers I got. Coming in there to take me out. You ever, yeah. you ever seen wow. Hal McCray on the on-deck circle with his helmet all crooked, looking crazy over there? <laughs> he was a menace, man. And oh, I had to take a turning a double play, and now these guys play like robots. You can't slide in the second base. You can't um, slide in the second base. Man, come on, man. Don't tell me about frustrated. <laughs> but, oh, What's the last time you seen a hit and run? Hey, man, I don't like the way the game is played today. I don't. I don't. I wouldn't have got a chance today if no. – Somebody was out scouting me. I wouldn't have got a chance for that. I'll tell you this much: when I see a player reach in his back pocket and pull out a card yeah. to oh. to look and see where to play somebody, to me, you should already know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, we I knew where to play people, and one of the things is some guys swung different. At, uh, with two strikes than they did with uh, a, a different counts, and 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 you move you moved with the count, and and the stuff that I mean I'm looking at people when they're looking in their pockets, and and pitchers do it too, trying to uh, uh, with something written down on how to pitch somebody, to me. Uh, you ain't learning nothing about all you're doing is trying to hit that spot. And and that, well, most of the time when you try to hit that spot, you don't. Just the kind of thing that it's overanalyzed and, and it's taken away the uh, fun in the game, it seems to me. And yep. I mean, hey, you know what? We're down to about a minute. Left, okay, left in the show. We got to bring Shooty back next week um, because yeah, there's a lot do. to talk about. The swing and A's. We can also maybe try to see if we can get Kip Gross, who does a show here, to talk about the 1990 season when the Reds and A's got on uh, went against each other. So that should be an interesting one as well. Okay, but let me say this, Mark. Yeah. I feel yeah. that the hitters should have gotten. Uh, uh, those teams out of the shift. They were giving yeah. you so much so much territory land out there the other way. I don't care. <laughs> that looked like free money to me. Yeah, well you got they don't work on that. 
they don't they don't do that no more. They don't come out there and hit the ball on the other side, move it over, move them in, fly ball. They complicated the game, you know, yeah. because statistics over time tell you that man, look here. That's why I'm telling you, quantified man. Oh, yeah. In the yeah. Industry. So Can you I come do. back next week? Sure, man. Give me a holler. Just let me know. Yeah, oh, we love to have them. And and we, we yeah. and we I will tell you next week also the seventies for baseball and football and I'm sixty two next week were the best decade I've ever seen. So the seventies for me in baseball and football, I'll put that up against anything. Yeah. yeah. All right, we'll have a birthday, bro. God bless you, uh, Shooty Babbitt. Hey, Billy, let everybody know how they can get a hold of you as we're approaching close to 400 here, man. This is amazing. Yeah, that's good. Uh, first off, I want to put in a plug for the North Legacy Project. Look it up online, and if you can help us, please do. We're working with undeserved kids and undeserved kids, undeserved kids and marginal kids. Uh but you can reach me at Bill Norte, one five at gmail dot com. And I thank you so much, Shudi, for being with us and and there's so much stuff that you know about the game and you watched it for a long time. And yeah. I wanna pick your brain on some of that stuff. Thank you so much though. So God bless you. Exactly. What a great guy. And as we wrap this up, catch the archive version, blogtalkradio.com forward slash Mancini Sports Podcast platforms. Wherever you subscribe to the podcast, we'll be back next week, part two, same time, with Shooty Babbitt talking about uh, the continuation of where baseball is headed, his illustrious career in uh, the analyst and scouting and stuff like that. Boy, it is going to be amazing to, to get in depth on that. And I will leave you with this. Kip Gross was telling me earlier today. Baseball has been around 100 and something years. There's only been 23,000 about Major League Baseball players, so it's a hard exactly. nut to crack. And you guys should tip your hat, man. It's the hardest thing in uh, life. And when I get up to heaven, God decides to send me back down, Major League Baseball player. Till then, guys, have a blessed one. Thanks for tuning in. And we can't wait for next week when I'm going to tell these guys why the Pirates didn't face the A's in the 70s. Till then, stay safe. Thanks, Mark. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.